And we're good to go. Hello, everybody. So for the second episode in a row, just as I hit the go live button, somebody said something uproariously funny. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate that. Uh, hello, and welcome to <laughs> Series 2, Episode 9 of Holistic Emails, Email and More, a Q&A with. I'm your moderator, Skip Federa. Uh, and for those of who are new to the show, on every episode, we showcase a different topic with a different panel of experts. And today, we're talking about the fluidity of data. Now, as you know, this is really your show. Uh, we bring together the experts, but it's your questions uh, that drive the conversation. It's unscripted, unrehearsed, usually a whole lot of fun. I can guarantee today is going to be a whole lot of fun if the, the pre-show chat was anything to go by. Um, now, a lot has changed over the last 18 months. Uh, and, you know, and one of the things that's changed, I mean, we can go into all things that's changed, but the thing we're going to talk about today is our database. Every one of us, all of our databases have changed. Some brands have seen huge increases uh, to their data, while others haven't, haven't, I wouldn't say have seen just the opposite. Maybe they haven't seen a huge increase, but they've seen a de definite shift in behavioral change. So what's happened with your data and what should you be doing about it? That's the question we're gonna be asking today. I encourage you all, please uh, ask your questions using the questions button on the right-hand side of your screen. <clears throat> and feel free to use the chat for everything else, uh, including giving us some feedback at the end. Now, this is always uh, uh, the place where I'd say, let's let's try to use the chat. Um, uh, let's try to use the chat, make sure it all works, build a little bit of interaction. But but today, Airmeet has added a new feature. Yeah. So um, if you go to the polls area, also okay. over there on the right, second one in, uh, we've got a poll for you. So I've just published the poll. Um, go ahead. Very topical question. What will the impact of the iOS 15 blocking tracking pixels have on email marketing? Now, some of the answers you might notice are a bit comical. Uh, welcome back, Batch and Blast. Oh, oh, good. Let's make the internet stupid. Been there, done that, had the t-shirt. Mm. And finally, we can focus on real metrics. So go ahead, answer the poll, and for bonus points to win nothing, but for bonus <laughs> points, put, it's like put, in the, put in the chat who came up with each answer. I'm sure we might be able to arrange some sort of, you know, some okay. sort of Twitter reward. Twitter reward. Oh my goodness. Okay, now. Uh, we've done all that. Yes. Let me, now we've got that started. Share you old screen. Uh, okay. So before we go any further, we should take a moment to thank our sponsors. This series has been brought to you by our gold sponsors, Iterable and Validity, and our silver sponsors, RPE Origin, RPE Origin and Email Expert. Thank you. Thank you all for everything that you do to help make this, uh, this uh, show possible. And thanks for Cass Menagerie in the background there. There are no dogs <laughs> being tortured in the performance of this webinar. Yeah, no, no, animals, no animals will be harmed in this webinar. Um, right. So if you want to go back uh, and catch up on any of the great episodes we had in Series 1, or you need to catch up on what we've done in Series 2 so far, you can find them all on YouTube and on the Holistic uh, email site. And we'll put a link in the chat uh, to, to all that. Now, um, OK. Right. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to go to this okay. one. I don't like that We're one. just all going to be anonymous. <laughs> We're no, we'll, get, we'll get back to that. We don't, need information. We, we don't matter, we're, we're, obviously. No, no, we just need to work. We just need to, clearly we, uh, the production staff and the writing staff need to work on which order the slides should come in. Oh, so, wow. um, uh, yes, afterwards, you know, let's face it, some of the questions you're going to have today are going to be very specific to your situation or they're maybe a little awkward. But don't worry, all of our speakers are going to be around afterwards at the roundtable sessions. You would have seen those roundtables when you came in today. And, um, so join us there. So you know, pull up a chair, turn on your camera, plug in your mic, and um, 
just join us as we keep the chat going in a bit more informal setting. Although as this has started out, I can't see how I can get any more informal than this. <laughs> but one person who joins us will be uh, in for a chance to win Calf Pay's uh, award-winning, or award finalist, I'm gonna say award-winning, best-selling book, Holistic Email Marketing. That's the Kindle version. Uh, if you do have the hard copy version though, again, always, 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 Look at the first page of praise. <laughs> the guy at the top is a genius. Now, <laughs> so we've put together uh, a panel today that is gonna help us uh, identify how our data has changed and what we should do about it. With me as always is best-selling author and this year's recipient of the EEC Email Marketer Thought Leader of the Year, Kath Pay of Holistic Email Marketing. We also have Email Marketer of the Year, uh, Scott Cohen of U.S. mattress giant Purple. We have Dr. Ada Bartlett uh, of Operations Operations Ally. Sorry, that's right. That. You got it. Operations Ally uh, and and Dr. Bartlett. I cannot remember um, what your PhD is in, but I remember it was looked very complicated. Uh, industrial um, and operations engineering. It's no worries. We yeah, all can no. do it. It's all good. It's easy. Just some, just some math. Exactly. Also, exactly. I, exactly. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop calling you Dr. Barlett because as this has probably happened to you many times before, and it's probably very annoying. As a huge West Wing fan, I would really struggle not to call you Dr. Bartlett. Yep. So I understand. I I'm yep. just gonna go with first names there. It, it is and, awesome. yep. and last but absolutely not least, uh, seven time finalist for the email thought leader of the year award. <laughs> Email marketing's what? very own Meryl Street. Oh my god. Co founder. Thanks. Co founder. I'll sign autographs after. RPE Origin, <laughs> uh, Ryan Phelan. Sorry. Yeah. And me. I'm not even sure I'm here. I, I'm not even a finalist. So you got to be in it to win it, Ryan. Me either. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I don't have a PhD. I, I'm feeling very inadequate at the moment. No, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wait till later. Okay. So, <laughs> while people get their questions into the um, uh, into the questions box, why doesn't everybody introduce themselves quickly? Scott, why don't we start with you? Uh, as Skip said, I'm Scott Cohen. I'm the senior email marketing manager at Purple. I like industry giant. That was nice, Skip. Um, <clears throat> I've been in the email space since 2009. It's hard to believe that it's been like a dozen years or more and i'm probably not even compared to kath and skip and ryan i'm a i'm a newcomer but been in this space a long time and happy to be here i think i think that's because we're old i think that's <laughs> not, I mean, no. if, if it experienced experience if it wasn't bad enough, me with the Meryl Streep line, you just called Ryan old. I mean, he's going to get a complex before the end of this, if we're not careful. <laughs> as soon as I'm here, my wife will call me old. So this is like, all that much. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He's Ryan, got thick skin. You, he's fine. Ryan, yeah. why don't you introduce yourself to, uh, to the audience? Oh, so, Ryan man. Phelan, co-founder of RPE Origin. Uh, been in the space since 1998, back in the day. Um, it is back in the day. Worked for a lot of the ESPs, worked uh, direct with Sears and Kmart, and uh, uh, excited to be here. Excited Ada's here. I really am, I am really just jazzed that she's here. I mean, not Skip so much, but Ada. I am. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. I, I, I'm cool with that. I'm, I'm jazzed that Ada's here as well. So, Ada, <laughs> why don't you tell people who you are? That's awesome. Well, as you mentioned, Skip, my name is Dr. Ada Barlett. Um, I am a cheerful engineer and data scientist, and I'm probably the newest uh, to the email marketing world. My background is in process improvement and helping people use data and processes to, to make improvements, and I've decided to focus on email marketing just a few short years ago, and it's been super fun because everyone's so nice. Um, and so in short, I help organizations use their email marketing data and turn them into meaningful and actionable insights. So I'm excited to be here and I feel very honored that everyone's excited. I'm excited to be here. So I'm excited that you're excited. Please, I'm here. please tell me that you have a podcast <laughs> called The Cheerful Engineer. I do not. No, I don't. Okay. Maybe well, we need to create one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And last but certainly not least, Kath. 
Hey, I'm Kath Perry, um, CEO of um, Boutique Consultancy Holistic Email Marketing. Um, as sorry, it's my cat. <laughs> <That's> okay, <laughs> one of the menagerie. Um, yeah, as as Skip said, um, so I've authored a book and uh, won some awards and all that kind of stuff. So it's all good. Life's good. I'm excited to be here with these amazing people. And um, I'm excited about this topic too, because data is, I know it's a challenge, right? So let's, although Ada probably says no, but you know, for the most of us who don't have PhDs, it can be a challenge, so it I'm excited. Be. Yeah, it's a lot of fun in my view, but yeah. So before we get, get into the topic, um, so folks don't forget, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A section over there on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. Oh, okay. um, so a quick question. I can never tell if this is mirrored image or not. So when I point this way, am I pointing at the right-hand side of the screen? You are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, excellent. I've been doing that all series and I just realized that might have been not the useful. Wrong way. Um, <laughs> so just, just uh, a quick update. Uh, the, the poll answers were inconclusive, but um, the guessing on who's who whose answers uh, we've got a tie at the moment. Yeah. So uh, Andy Bowen uh, correctly guessed that I have the T-shirt, and Matthew Dunn correctly guessed that. Uh, Congratulations. Ryan uh, commented. Cert uh, the stupid comment was certainly Ryan. <laughs> so this is just very positive. The Ryan loves best. <laughs> this is actually not a webinar. This is a roast. <laughs> yeah. Hi. So let's, let's, uh, let's actually get into some some business here. Um, so, uh, fluidity of data. We all know that databases change, right? Our database mm -hmm. is constantly changing. And every time, you know, I've heard any of you speak on the topic of process improvement or testing, it's, you know, at some point you need to go back and retest everything because your database will have moved away from that, sure. right? Mm -hmm. So we all know that happens. But historically, that's been pretty glacial, right? It's been a pretty slow mm -hmm. pace of change. And obviously, mm -hmm. everything has been going, and predictable, yeah, exactly. With everything that's been going on in the last 12 to 18 months, Oh, as I said earlier, a lot of companies have seen really radical shifts. What what kind of things have you you guys seen, Scott? Uh, let's start with you as the as the brand guy. Like, well, I mean, COVID changed the world, right? I mean, that's the easiest thing to say on any webinar. Um, but what we saw last year was the shift to direct to consumer that we frankly expected this year. You know, so we have direct to consumer and we have a wholesale business. We're in a bunch of, you know, mattress firms and Bed Bath and Beyond and all that. And because everything shut down or a lot of things shut down here in the States, um, you know, people were at home. They said, I'm sitting on shitty stools to do work or I'm working from bed and my mattress sucks. And so there was a lot like home goods overall did really well last year because people were at home. And so we saw this huge shift to direct to consumer. And then this year we're seeing the shift back a little bit. We're seeing like people are leaving the house again. So it's the growth that we saw. I would say for some companies, their growth was so big in, especially in the direct to consumer that they probably can't even comp it this year. Because the world, I mean, mm -hmm. the world changed so much and it's slowly changing back that like, how do you account for, how do you account for aberrations is really the, the question mm -hmm. that I would ask the rest of the panel. Like, how do you account for mm -hmm. what I would call a giant aberration in your data? Yeah, because it's, so it's straight away now, you know, a, a really good, you know, um, uh, metric or, or report to be running is always your year on year so that you're actually comparing month mm -hmm. with month. So February 2020 yeah. with February 2021 and so on. That's thrown out the door. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but it becomes an outlier, right? In any data set, yeah. you'll have a you'll have a set of data that's an outlier that doesn't match, that doesn't make sense. 
And, and, and I think, you know, what I've worked with businesses on is when doing year over year comparisons, everybody's using 2019 and skipping 2020 mm -hmm. as that aberration, as that exception. Yeah. Um, but I think there are some insights into what are the possibilities of what a consumer will do in certain situations. So marketing is very predictable. Data is very predictable. We've all gotten used to the predictability of everything, but 2020 threw it in a loop. So now we got a, a vision into, okay, this is possible if I give them the right yes. benefit. And so now the challenge is to take in the business terms to take 2020 out of the equation, but in data terms to use it as that indicator of intent if given the right situation. I love that. I, I, that's beautiful. I, I feel like there's there's always value in any data that you, you can collect within the right context. Is sort of my perspective. So if you're if you have it, if you can look at it and understand um, the context from under which you collected it, and then understand what scenarios that it makes sense to compare it to and not. So you might not want to look at year over year, but you might want to look at month over month, or depending on how often you're sending, you might even be looking like week to week. Um, and trying to identify, you know, like, okay, these are certain trends that we're seeing, um, looking at where we might be now. And I'm curious for, for Scott, like you mentioned that 20, like 2020 was such a big year and you're seeing people move back, which um, is interesting in and of itself. Do, how far back do you anticipate people moving? Like, do you, do you see it going all the way back to 2019 or do you think that there is? No, no. It's so like, you know, you look at the trends and, like we saw, I saw data about a month ago. It was like, we were growing on this trajectory and then it was literally like a step level or two in May mm -hmm. of last year. Like it was For doing, sure. I'm trying to think like going this way and then it went <laughs> like this, right? Sure. And so the growth is like, if you look at it from after the step level, it's actually been coming down. But if you look at the trend line, it's pretty, like the trend line's pretty straight yeah. up. Like not straight up, but like where the growth would be expected. But I think it's common for businesses to just assume, oh, we saw this growth last year. That growth will continue right. in some oh, respect yeah. and not accounting for the fact that Q2 last year, everything changed. For sure. So yeah. you, like, you, you have to look at it from that. When we saw that data, it was like, oh, yeah, our forecasting was wrong. But, you know, <laughs> like, like that's, that's the stuff you have to think about. You, and didn't, you didn't plan for a pandemic? You didn't, yeah. I don't I mean, know about you, Skip. I mean, you did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Professionally well, yeah, well, or personally, Ryan? Like, oh no, personally, I had my in-laws move in. That was perfect. That was yeah. great. Let's, yeah. let's have the in-laws move in. Perfect timing, and then let's right? Let's trap everybody in the house. <laughs> oh my goodness! So, do you, do you set up cameras. So, do you having your live sitcom going on? Is that what's happening? Yeah. Oh, God, okay, yes. Yeah. Comes out on MTV here in a couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That would be a good one. That would be a good one. Uh, so That's a, so Scott, what, what were you plotting? Were you plotting the number of subscribers? Were you plotting sales? Like what? What was well, that, the, that or, was just or did were they correlated? That so we're still trending in the right direction, email wise. Uh, we're okay. getting better about what we're tracking there. Okay. You know, last year when I came on to Purple, it was we don't have much of a CRM program. Emails underappreciated. Mm. Build this thing. So we built. A whole bunch and this year is like the year of repeat right so it's next logical product how do we get into that diving into that data and i think that would have happened anyway mm -hmm. because yeah. that's the natural growth of a what yeah. i would consider a good email program is you dive into the data you say okay if they bought this what are the top four products in the next order sure, and yeah. ironically enough you know we don't have that many SKUs, but it's basically like these three and the same with the same thing they bought before so it's like okay you know there's a lot of data that points to that but those are, awesome. but in terms of like overall growth and sales for the company, like it was, we knew that Q2 was huge. We didn't know how big till we saw that chart. It was like grow, grow, like it just took, like literally it's it not even one step level. It was like three step levels up. Mm -hmm. And right. so that's why I'm going, well, how do you account for that in comps? Cause you're yeah. in the Q2, are we going to be able to comp at all? You can't, you know, there's you no just, way to, there's no, yeah. because the market conditions do not match year over year. Yeah, and yeah. what you can do is say we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're going to um, estimate our increase uh, versus 2019, maybe a stretch goal, right? But it's gonna take all of 2021 to get back onto a track that naturally and financially should fit in right after 2019. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So, I mean, yeah, if you're going to build a correlation model, you'd almost have to um, downweight 2020. Yeah, you know, usually mm -hmm. you downweight the older data, but in this case, you downweight the the newer data. Well, and that speaks to back to the original question of testing again, because your database is going to mm. be different. Yeah, the market yeah. conditions for how those people came in are different. Even holiday to holiday, like oh, it's Christmas. Everyone shops the same way at Christmas. No. no, the way they shopped in 2019 is completely different from the way they shopped in 2020. Or even the what we call the big tent sales: your President's Day, your Memorial Day, your Labor Day, July 4th over here in the states. Um, you know, though even those different microcosms. Because like I'm mailing more often now, just to compete with how my emails did last year for Memorial right. Day. Because yeah. people were right. just like, I'm geared in, I'm ready to buy because I'm at home. And now they're like, woohoo, vacations well, again. And yeah. I think that the, but, uh, the other piece of that is not only were people at home ready to buy, but I know at least here in the UK, that was also about the same time that everybody got their refunds or started to get their refunds from their holidays. Yeah. I mean, I got a big what? refund for my April, you know, my Easter holiday back to the States. Did I save that? No. Did I pay off a credit card with it? No. I bought the biggest Weber grill I could fit in my in my <laughs> courtyard, right? And I bought a lovely little table and chair set. And I, you know, I can imagine people are at home; they want stimulus their house checks to be nicer. Stimulus, stimulus checks, checks. checks. But, the same way. But Skip, There's were they ready to buy, or they were ready to buy in a certain vertical? That vertical didn't work out, and so they 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 shift. I don't know that they were ready to buy what they ended up buying from an intent scale, right? Mm. Oh, I agree. I agree. I, mm -hmm. I, I think the intent shifted to the new situation. Yes. Well, well yeah. In your, the, the so in your, and in your case, I can't go away mm. on holiday, so I'm going to make my stay at home that That's much nicer. Awesome. Hence why all the, you know, the, the home purchases, including mattresses. And this is a really, really interesting point to, because, you know, we all know that there's a lot of people who aren't au fait or aren't traditionally uh, – web users or you know online purchases mm. right they've come sure. on board and that's what's driven a lot of the of the new data and think about the impact it's had because i mean for for me probably you know the a mattress that is a very um you have to be very au fait and very at home with buying online to buy a mattress right so mm -hmm. i'm sure there's something <laughs> in your Right, because that, that's a oh, huge sure. investment, and it's a huge potential risk. I mean, you know, you guys are awesome, but but as far as you know, trying it and all that kind of stuff, it's it's a totally new new thing. It's not like just going in and buying something, you know, a, a coffee maker on yeah, Amazon it's, it's, or anything. It's yeah. a considered purchase, right? And anytime it's a considered, considered purchase, you, there's the balance, and I'm sure Ada can speak to this a lot. You know, there's mm. the it's like finding out. Like one of my big challenges is finding out how far along in the funnel they are before they raise their hand. There are yes. some people who raise their hand early and then you just start mm -hmm. feeding them information. And there are some people who only raise their hand at the very end and go, I'm mm -hmm. ready to buy right. discount, please. You know, something like right. that, especially for, you know, mattresses are not a cheap you know thing to buy. So um, that's a, that's a big challenge. I think only became more so. And then we also have the added, difficulty of we we own our own retail stores and we have wholesale and how does all that data what mm -hmm. we can get because wholesale is you know yeah, yeah. we just tell you how many we bought from you not who bought from you yeah, um, yeah you know but how like where is the data coming from and then again that that journey is the hardest thing to piece together because it's yes. like you know there's this big window of consideration and people can sign up for your email in any piece of it but Scott, I don't, I, I don't want us to all. I don't want you to feel like you have four people picking, trying to pick your brain. So I'm going to open this up to the rest of the rest of the. Uh, <laughs> Kath, Kath made a really good point with the number of new entrants into e-com, into e-commerce. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, uh, the data in the UK, and I haven't been able to find a comparably reliable mm -hmm. source in the US. But if anybody has one, please let me know. The data in the UK is online sales never got above forty percent. Okay. During the pandemic. Of what? Of total of, retail. Of total retail. Of total retail. Yeah. Uh, excluding petrol, ex ex and that excludes gasoline. Interesting. Um, yeah, and, and and it peaked. There were two peaks in the last year. Uh, 
once the beginning of lockdown and once when we hit our second or third wave, I can't remember what wave we're on now, we're on our second or whatever. Um, it's, it, but, you know, so I guess going back to your point, Scott, yeah, it is going to shift back because as soon as anything started to open up, people very quickly went back to the shops. But Kath, Brian, Ada, are you guys seeing was, that as well as your clients? I was, I was going to say, you know, yeah. there was a, the, the day-long queue outside like Primark as soon as Primark opened up because you couldn't buy online from Primark in the UK. Right. And so everyone was queuing. That's probably going to account for like 20% of the total sales, retail sales for the year. It was crazy. Primark's first, week, Primark's first <laughs> weekend, they did a quarter's worth of sales. Yeah. Wow. In a weekend. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I find that for me, I think it would, do, from I'm looking personally, my personal opinion, as well as reflecting on some of the organizations I've worked with, I think it really depends on like the vertical and the, the demographics of the market that they're looking to serve. Like I think of my mother who was in the States, like, you know, she was, she's itching to get out of the house no matter what for lots of things. But if I think of some of the, some of the services that I've seen that are converting from in-person meetings or in-person gatherings to being online for the foreseeable future, people and organizations that are working with younger um, individuals that might already be really comfortable with shopping online. I think that for them, they may stay online and they may experience the benefits of reduced overheads. And there are like, you know, there are other benefits to be said with changing how you operate. So um, I think that that's really important. One quick point that, that I just wanted to make based on uh, Scott's point is that there we've been talking a lot about the actions of the um, the consumers, the buyers, the people on our lists, which are important to track. I think that's really awesome. But I think that also needs to be taken in consideration is our actions on the marketing end, right? Like what kinds of promotions were we doing? How often were we emailing? I think we saw the volume of emails really increase uh, during the pandemic. And so balancing, you know, it's not always a perfect science, uh, but balancing both sides of like what people were doing and how they were reacting and signing up with what we were doing in terms of what we were putting out there, how frequently and what kinds of offers we were making is is important to tease out what really happened and what might happen in the future. Well, and, but, and I think the, also when when did the uh, when did the pandemic stop being the content and start being the context? Mm, I love that. That's um, well, yeah, I love that. But, but one of the on. things. I've, go ahead, right. Kath. Go ahead. I was just going to say one of the things that we we do need to take into consideration too, though, is those new people who who might have just dabbled in it because they had to, and now they've gone back to offline shopping again. Mm -hmm. Do you know what they're going That's to do true. now? Mm -hmm. They're going to be adding to our inactive mailing list, aren't they? Great point. Great point. Right. So we we're going to have to start to you know delve into our data, start looking at these kind of things, start asking lots of questions and really really have something in place for for if you do believe that you have got a lot of those mm -hmm. dabblers let's call them um I like it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, well is it is it is it but it's it there's a uh, another piece of that that um, backs that up kath is there's a, a a stat here in the uh again it's a uk stat that 86 percent of people um I might have the number wrong. A large number of people, I think it was like 86% or 87, tried a new brand yeah. during mm -hmm. during uh, lockdown. Yep. Mm -hmm. And about 48% of those are going to stick with the new brand. So you're going to yes. have a bunch of dabblers mm -hmm. and all of a sudden a bunch of really engaged people that are yes. quite new. But yes. remember, yeah. that, that segment of people is a fragile segment. Right. Mm. So it is a segment that got used to prefers because they've forgotten about the old. And in that segment, if there is a disruption in the brand equity, a disruption in the customer, uh, uh, the brand equity, mm -hmm. right? Bad customer experience, bad product, whatever. They will switch faster than most because they've yes. been somewhere else and had an affinity. For sure. Um, sure. But I did want to go back to Kath's earlier point. You talked about how uh, people switched behaviors and now they're not doing something anymore. The, the, mm -hmm. d there's more depth to that. Think about this example. Mm -hmm. So I'm the home chef. I, I, prior to the pandemic, go to the store. I shop in store. I shop every Sunday. I was fairly religious about going to the same store, use the point yep. program and all that stuff. Then 
during pandemic, I signed up for Instacart because I couldn't go in the store. And I did pick up at the curb because I didn't go in the store, right? So it was a mix of two, and I was pretty reliant on Instacart. And now what's – so Tom Thumb, the grocery store, would have recognized that. Ryan's spend has gone down because I can't identify spend to Ryan through Instacart because Instacart takes all those points. Right. Now they see me come back. What does Instacart do? What does Tom Thumb do? What, how does Instacart and think about Instacart. I was never a customer. Now I'm a customer. Now I'm a diminished customer. Do they look at the reality and say, this is how we now market to Ryan who may use me every once in a while because he's too lazy to go to the store or we, you know, what is it? Is there an intelligence that takes human behavior mm. and matches it with, with predictable behavior or something that I can influence in terms of intent? Well, let's, let's add another layer into that prime. And that is um, <clears throat> I'm also the home chef. And at the beginning of lockdown, I replaced one of my frying pans with mm-hmm. this beautiful Le Creuset nonstick um, frying pan. And I, I just had to add another one uh, a couple of weeks ago because the, the first one was starting to stick a little bit. And I'm like, I said to said to my wife, Yo, I was, we spent a lot of money in this pan. I'm really disappointed. And she said, think about how that pan was designed. It was not designed to be used twice a day, every day for a year. Yes. <laughs> right. You've probably put five years worth of wear and tear into that pan in one year's time. So yes. for anybody that has a product, Mm-hmm. That it had, you know, they they think about the the life cycle of this product. Probably not a mattress because we didn't sleep any more during the pandemic than than we would have before. Theoretically, but but you know, other stuff. <laughs> I, I would say I did. Naps, naps, skip naps. No, I no, I didn't get into naps. Um, get enough, but well, but and Ryan is a purple customer, to be fair. I am a purple customer. <laughs> it's all Scott's fault, but I am a purple customer. <laughs> and I will say, as just a little testimonial, I went uh, went on the road, went to Miami last week, slept on a hotel bed, came home, settled into my purple mattress, and I was like, oh, that feels nice. <laughs> oh, very nice, very nice. All right, now I get commission on anything sold there. today. There you go, Scott. All you got, all you got to do is sell, sell to a Virtual hotel chain. Virtual high five. That's right. That's right. S- sell to a hotel chain, and you'll have all the email marketers staying there. It's true. So, Ada, so what? Can, I got a question but, for okay. Ada. Oh, go oh, ahead. Yeah. No, I was gonna. I was gonna mention uh, Skip's uh, Skip's example, which I thought was really exciting in terms of, and, and and your point as well, Ryan, in terms of being able to track loyalty of someone and watch it go off and watch it come back. I know that I've received lots of messages from lots of different organizations um, but because my, my you know, I'll use one, I'm, my husband and I are huge cruisers. Who would have thought we didn't cruise during the pandemic? Um, but, you know, watching all of the cruise lines quite um, persistently contact my husband and I to get very, 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 um, you know, we cruise four times a year back onto ships um, has been a really interesting uh, journey in, in marketing. So that, that sort of aligns really well with what you said, Skip, in terms of, and, and, and Ryan, you as well. Um, identifying like who, who of your database, like who are the people that are most likely to come back um, mm-hmm. and how can you incentivize them to come back? And then similarly, identify if you, if you do run this online business um, and you've seen lots of new people show up, how do you incentivize these new people to stick around? I think that's a really great point um, yeah. that I wanted to add in there. It's, ahead, it's, almost like pre, <laughs> it's almost like pre-COVID, we were, we were comfortable and complacent with Batch and Blast, with not doing sophistication. I mean, there was a percentage of marketers that did it, but for the most part, we saw a lot of Batch and Blast and we saw this, this, this kind of... Um, uh, arch on who was sophisticated and who wasn't, right? Mm-hmm. And so 2020 came along, and now everybody had to get sophisticated in some respect because they had needed to figure out what the hell was happening to their data, what yes. was happening to new data, and all that stuff. So now we're on the other side of it, and I think the challenge for most marketers is greater because if mm-hmm. you go back to what you did in 2019, you're going to lose the advantage you got in 2020. And if you don't keep up, you're going to lose more than 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 just the people you gained, because I think people 
you know, there's there's arguments about empathy. There's arguments about connectedness to the consumer. There's a there's a lot of messages around delivering relevant value. And so I think a lot of marketers need to step up and say, listen, that complexity that we talked about and did in a hurry in 2019 and 2020 needs to be continued and increased. Mm. I would have framed it as a challenge. I, maybe it's my positive outlook. I, I see it more as an opportunity. Like this is a great opportunity. <laughs> this is a great opportunity yeah. that we all have to to provide better services and more timely messages um, to people based on the information that they're, you know, they're sharing with us. Now, this might take us into the whole tracking thing, but um, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. But Kathy, you were going to say something, I think. No, I was just going to say, you know, this is just posing a, a question here, right? Mm -hmm. As all of our reports, all of our data, all of our, you know, everything is based on humans and their habits and their changing habits. So this is what's caused everything, right? Now, you know, how much also do we need to, even more so than ever before, not just read the reports, you know, the ones like Skip has just said about, you know, mm -hmm. shopping and everything like this, but also understand then more, and I know Ryan's a huge reader of, of all the you know newspaper articles and really getting into this because I think that we might find that people, a, a lot of them, not everyone, have actually changed altogether. And so many people oh. I speak, I've got, I've, got, I've got a lot of percentage of friends who are just like, let me at the pub, let me go dancing, let me do this, you know, I want to, can't wait for to go on holiday. And other ones are just kind of like, well, I had a really, kind of nice quiet time and I've actually discovered I don't need all that extra stuff mm -hmm. I'm kind of yeah. cool as is you know so they've mm -hmm. actually like slowed down and changed and so we have to start looking at that as well human behavior Ex yeah exactly I, I'll give you a great example um, so we, mm -hmm. we've been out to dinner twice uh, since uh, March 11th of 2020 and both times lovely meal uh, both times, you know, prior to lockdown, I, I would have said it, it would have been, you know, it was nice, but not Instagrammable. It was just a nice, nice meal out. But then, then you look at the cost and the cost was like the same as a weekly shop. And I'm thinking, well, we're making better food than this at home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, I think, and, and I had an interesting conversation with my neighbor as a restaurateur, and that's one of the challenges that he faces. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have what he would call a celebration restaurant. He doesn't have, uh, you know, he doesn't have a Michelin star restaurant. He's got four very nice restaurants, and they've got a really good ethos because all the produce comes from his family farm, and so it's you know all farm to table kind of stuff. It's all totally on, on. Uh, on kind of message in the food yeah. world at the moment. Mm -hmm. But he's like, but we know that we're not gonna get as many covers because we don't think, you know, people won't go out sort of casually as much, or that's their expectation, at least not for 2020 and, or 2021 and going into 2022. I think, so, yeah, uh, short term, it's probably not. I think short term, I would agree. I mean, we don't go out we don't go out to normal everyday places. We go out, if we do go to normal everyday places it's because we're too damn tired to cook. Yeah. But if if we go out, we go out serious, high end, you know, I wanna see something that I could not make or my mother-in-law could not make, right? right? That's what I wanna see when I go out. But we don't go to steakhouses anymore. We don't go to, there's certain cuisines we don't go to anymore because there's no way they can make it better than myself or my mother-in-law and whatever. And I think that that a lot of people have, have kind of got that is the cost for going out is just insane right now. Just, it's just a plain old restaurant. Yeah. I think, mm -hmm. I think it, it shifted to being an event, right? Before it was yeah. just, Oh, we're just going to go out. Like you didn't think about yes. it. Now there's, I hate it's to like say that. Well, but there's also a risk involved, mm -hmm. right? You know, you never thought about the risks of leaving your house before COVID, <laughs> but now you have to literally go, is it worth my mother who lives with us getting mm -hmm. sick and dying to go to McDonald's? Yeah. You know, I mean, and that's Kat, to your point yep. about fundamental changes in people's behavior. There's, there are some people who just don't care 
and they'll go out no matter what. And they've, that's been true for the past year. They just haven't been yeah, able to right. go everywhere and they get pissed off if they get asked to wear a mask and shoot people and whatever. But most yeah. reasonable people have been like, they're, they're, some, they're somewhere in the middle on that risk equation, right? And for us, since I have my mother at home, we were very, 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 very careful. Mm-hmm. And we almost never left the house unless it was like, to your point, or to your point, Ryan, about groceries, like we probably will never go back to doing full grocery buys in the store. We will only go out if we can't get it <clears throat> from like shipped or Instacart or Walmart or whatever. Right. So like those changes in behavior, you have to track and watch. Yeah. 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 And then it'll be really important to identify segments of people to Kat's point. Like some people are going to go out and they are going to, you know, they're, they're having weddings and they're having big celebrations and they're people on cruise ships in the, in the world right now. Right. So there are some people that will do that and identifying how we elicit that information will be an interesting challenge, but, um, or opportunity, I should say, but, um, like how we figure out who these segments of people are and, and talk to them, uh, differently will be an interesting thing to observe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's going to, so, segmentation is going to get a lot more complicated. And actually, that gets back into the empathy component as well. You know, empathy isn't the president of the company sending out an email to everybody saying, you know, we care about your health and we care about our staff's health and this is what we're going to do and rah, rah, rah. It's, it's understanding that some people you know, who are, would still define themselves as a loyal customer are not going to come to your store and buy from you. So you okay. better find another way to, to deliver to them. If you're a restaurant, maybe it's a food box or mm-hmm. you know, something along those lines. Exactly. Um, exactly. But that, you know, that's great for the data geeks in us because we love, we love all kinds of extra segmentation. Yeah. Um, so Math- Matthew's put a question in the chat. Matt, you did put a question in the chat. Um, the other PhD in email. There's probably more, but yes. the, I literally the only two I know. Um, uh, I'm in good company. And, uh, uh, you are. Uh, actually, he's in better company. Um, Demi- uh. the, the demise of the third-party cookie, uh, <laughs> Apple IDs, and now the Apple Pixel email tracking, which we alluded to earlier. Is data coherence going to be tougher, stroke more expensive, is Matthew's question. And I'm going to take, mm. take it one step further. Based on the conversation we've had, it sounds to me like you would all agree that data coherence is going to be even more important. That idea. It's already hard. So thanks, Apple. But, um, <laughs> it, it, you know, when the, the, the third party cookie put email on the map as first party data, super important. And I don't think that this changes anything. It just puts proper KPIs at the forefront. I think the companies mm-hmm. that are going to struggle the hardest are like the newsletter companies mm-hmm. and people who send content where open really is mm-hmm. their metric because it's about yeah. consuming the content and they, they don't go to the extra level. My philosophy is with my emails is I don't want them to read. I want them to click through and order. Right. Yeah. So, right. you know, yeah. I give content for people that want to read and I give easy scan and click for everybody else. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So, Opens and I'm and we're gonna have to see. There's debate going. I mean, what this is less than 24 hours old, right? This news from Apple. You know, are, are we gonna see an uptick in open rate because of caching or whatever they're gonna end up doing, and they're just gonna say everybody opened it, or is it gonna disappear? We don't know yet, fully. So it'll be. I've always viewed opens as directional, mostly for deliverability. Mm-hmm. Um, it, my metrics have always been, did I sell stuff? So I, I don't know how much that's going to change, but I think it's going to make segmentation more important. All these things more important that, by mm-hmm. the way, are really hard to do to begin with. Mm-hmm. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. And now you have a lack the, of data. The, the, other, the other thing is, too, though, is that it, is this then also opening up the way for them actually then, because of privacy reasons, stopping the tracking on clicks too is that possible well even if you stop the tracking on clicks there may be ways through like url parameters and other things that you can clicks are tracked through the pass through yeah Yeah. i've got i've got a uh but they could do yeah on on one of my browsers it tells you when you clicked on a redirect Mm -hmm. Mm. And, and so now, obviously, if I've clicked on an email that I've opted into, I know it's a, I, I know it's redirected. I don't care, 
Uh, I'm also in the email marketing industry, so I know what a redirect is and how they work. Um, so the, the, the question then becomes, you know, how does the consumer react to that? But Kath, to your, to your immediate question, could Apple do that or could Gmail do that? Um, you know, Gmail has always said, well, at least the last time I heard them say anything on this topic, they don't look at clicks. They do. No. Conspiracy that's, theory. That's what they say. Yeah. That, um, yeah, they have to. But they, but there's no way there's no way they could there's no way the recipient could block the tracking of clicks because to do that would turn off the click. Like. Mm-hmm. Well, then you have to wonder if they're going to, like, this is sort of top level blocking. Are we going to get to the point where it's like, <clears throat> don't block this sender, don't block this sender. They can find out what, like, are people going to choose who to be, who to get a personalized experience from? And are people savvy enough to do that? I mean, yeah, we know it's redirects. I would have envisioned that the average customer doesn't because it redirects very quickly. Um, I mean, if you did common sense of, well, they just want to know who's doing what and blah, 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 blah. Most people are like, if it's a brand they care about, they won't care. If it's a brand they're just dabbling in, they probably do. So. Yeah, yeah. Know. But then you, you, you've got to look at human nature, right? Human nature by, um, we are always going to go with, the majority of us will always go with whatever is offered to us by default. Because we're sure. actually mm -hmm. quite lazy. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So, so it's only those, you know, true um, advocates of privacy or those that are really fearful. And they're, if that's the case, then they're usually only accepting text-only email anyhow. They've turned off HTML, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. So, yeah. Yeah, we don't like to make decisions ever. No. No. But back to, Scott, back to, to your point about <clears throat> opens. And, yes, my, my answer was been there done that, got the t-shirt, is that, you know, we saw this when when uh, Microsoft turned off images by default. Mm -hmm. right. We saw a huge drop mm -hmm. in opens. Again, it wasn't any different, well, it was different than the pandemic, but it was the same kind of event where for the first 12 months, you had to always explain why you're open, where it went. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. And then once once it got off the back, back end of the chart, then it was fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you adjusted. Uh, so we're getting some uh, loads of questions in the chat and in the q and I'm going to go to the Q&A first because those people are, are following the rules. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. And this is from uh, uh, Antoinette. Um, how do we think Ooh. the hidden opens will impact A-B testing mm. and subject lines? Actually, we got one of those questions in the chat, too. So. Uh, that's they're both, they're both from and, my team. So yeah, <laughs> go ahead and answer oh. that. Nice. Can I can I take it? Can I take it? I mean, so yes, okay, so I've always been an advocate for not actually using unless you're a publisher or you are your your whole purpose of sending the email is to measure the success of it via open rates, then I don't think that you should be using open rates in in testing subject lines. So from my perspective, it's only going to be pushing you to the closer metric or the uh, accurate me metric um, that you should be using anyhow. Now, there are different cases mm -hmm. and everything, but through all the hundreds of, of tests that I have done and the analysis of, of, of customers' databases, there, there's a litmus test that I use. It's really, really simple. Anyone can do it. You don't even have to be clever with data because I'm not. All you do is you go and get your 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 highest, say, 10 to 30 to 50 opens, right? Um, your campaigns, list them all out. Mm -hmm. Then you get your highest, you know, say 50 of your click, um, based on the clicks, right? You, you put them out and then you get the same with your conversions. Now go and have a look. It's easy if you just do it with 10. But it will show you that opens do not necessarily correlate to clicks, which don't necessarily correlate to conversions. I, Ryan, I, I would agree with you. The only thing I would say is stop focusing on the freaking subject line. <laughs> Focus on yes. something else. It, and, and I get, and this is a rant, right? So I'm going to put brackets around this. 
Love it. I think the worst thing we did as an industry on the ESP class was make it easy for people to test subject lines and nothing else. Yeah. They didn't yeah. develop reporting for dynamic content. They didn't make dynamic content easily. They didn't make A-B testing or, or more complex uh, testing scenarios easy. They just threw out subject line and said, this is the only testing you can do easily within the platform. And we as an industry have obsessed around that damn subject line. And it's in, infuriating because you ask people, do you test? Oh, yeah, I test subject lines every mm -hmm. time. And it's like, no, you don't. You just phoned it in. You're testing. And it's, you say so, you're testing. Yes, you're testing. And, yeah, and, you're, and, and you're this, not learning. This, no, you're not learning. You, you're doing an ad hoc test. This, th these words against these words. You're not learning anything from it, and you're yeah. probably even optimizing for the wrong result if yeah. you were to learn, yeah. because you're basing it on the open rate. You know, and this does stem for what you were saying, Ryan, which is one of my pet peeves. Um, and, you know, I love you guys, you technology guys, you vendors, you're amazing. I used to be one, right? So I understand what you guys go through, but you tend to educate and everything based upon your features, your features. tactics and everything. And therefore mm -hmm. the, the, the marketers learn from you. So mm -hmm. when you're doing a new feature, do it so that it actually makes sense. That it's not just the easy mm -hmm. way to do it because yes, you know, to your point, Ryan, marketers well, just think that's a, subject lines. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's yeah, that's, that's a lovely sentiment, Kath. And I, and you know, I used to be on the technology side as well, but that's, mm -hmm. that's easier said than done for sure. Because what she makes sense like to one marketer doesn't make sense to the, to another. I think no, but even do, with the wow. basic things, so so dot digital, they were one of the first ones that I was aware of who actually allowed you to a b t, uh, a b split test based on conversions through mm -hmm. the system, right? Incredibly helpful. There are some systems still out there who only allow you to do the a b split test on open rates, and the others right. started putting in the click click rates and everything like that. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And, and that's not suitable. I mean, obviously, yeah, conversions even, even aren't going to be the, for everyone. Even the dot digital system, as good as it is, uh, only lets you optimize for one one variable. Yeah. So uh, if you mm -hmm. you know you could you could optimize for the wrong variable. But let's take this sorry. rant. Sorry, sorry. Let's Can I jump in? I, I want to jump in. Really, what okay. this makes more important here is tracking influence as well. So mm. whether, whether people or like. When I was in my previous job, and we're doing a little bit now, we look at somebody who received an email and then ordered within 48 hours to seven days sure. for an open, right? So the open metric is going to get skewed. I'm going to have to rethink how we do it. Mm -hmm. But when I ran it at my previous stop, I said, let's look at everybody who received an email from us last week and ordered in any channel within 48 hours yes. of doing yeah. that. 40% of revenue came from non-openers. Yes. 40%. Yeah. Right. For so sure. we, we, we can't. Like I don't, that part we need, like one thing to take away from me for today is go look at that, those metrics in your program, see what that influence is like. You don't need a 28 day look back or some other stuff that, mm -hmm. you know, social might be doing, but that is an important sort of branding metric. I call it the, right. your, your bill is due email, right? If the, your bill is due, you never open it, but you go pay your bill. The emails worked. Yeah. So P, yeah. especially yeah. for something that's a high consideration purchase, like a mattress, somebody might see the email and go, I don't have time now, but I'm going to go shop tonight. And then they may never go back to the email. They just may go shop. Yeah. But, we, yeah. but you, you it's, see it's that incremental. Getting something to search on. Yeah, exactly. And then you also, I mean, you look at, like, I can look at my daily, I call it the crack meter, the little, how much are we selling and what we, <laughs> what we think is, what we think we're going to sell for the rest of the day. Every day we mail an email, every day we send an email, it goes like, duke, 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 when the email starts going out. Like, right, so right. there is obvious influence there that may sure. not be tracked directly to an open or even a click. So look at those Correct. metrics as well. But that's a problem with our attribution theories that oh, are yeah. severely thraw of a flaw. Oh, for sure. They're, Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Last click yeah. attribution assumes that I have to have a click to make a purchase. And purchase. to your point, it doesn't. Yeah. And that's why this importance of the open is just ridiculous because number one, nobody's getting paid for an open. Nope. I can't remember the last time I was in a in a meeting with executives and said, "Oh, what's our open rate?" And, I, had, some, I had one client. Yeah, some verticals are right. Some verticals want the open, and 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 that's fine. But 
for the most of us, people are focusing too much on the subject line, not much inside the body of the email. I'm sure Ada right. could go on for a half an hour and multi-touch. Okay. I, 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 I'm going to start off here. I'm, I'm I'm gonna gonna bring, oh, go ahead. I was going to add one quick thing. And, and then I want to say something then, final too. Final comment. Uh, okay. No, 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 please. Uh, cast, cast, cast the boss. I got to let Kath go. Okay, well, I'll make this super quick. I think the important part or the important mindset that kind of ties everything everyone was saying as I was clapping in the background is what are the essential steps in someone actually achieving the goal that you want? So purchasing mm -hmm. a mattress or booking something or making that purchase. I, in very rare circumstances, will opening or clicking an email be on this sort of key steps in order to purchase, to go from not knowing about what your business does to purchasing, this, the emails are supporting yeah. this process. They're not the core steps in this process. They're not the essential steps in the process. And so measuring an, an excruciating detailed steps of the process that are not essential doesn't help you achieve your larger goal. Yep. That's no, a great point. That's absolutely brilliant. That. Really, really true. And and all I'm all I'm wanting to say is the DMA, D, DMA email marketing, um, what the consumer tracker um, study, every year, in the UK, they do that, and every year they ask the recipients, "What are the, you know, the three top steps that you will take when you receive an email that of interest to you?" And click through is not always at the top. Mm -hmm. They will save the email it's, it's for later. Usually the, they will, it's usually not at the top. They will bear the information in mind, right? So this speaks directly to what you were saying. And this, this is the, the important thing that we often over, overlook when it comes to email is the nudge factor and, and how it really does nudge decisions because it's the same as a billboard, you know, us walking out of board right in oh. front of you. Oh, okay. and she's back. You're back. You're oh, back. did You're I go? It's, it's like a billboard. A billboard right in front of you and and that's the power of email and then of course what does this do with our measurement for our data it totally totally <laughs> throws it out the window because again we still you know but but this is why it's so important email data and this is to your point ada email data is one thing and we i think marketers tend to base too many decisions on email data without actually looking at, you know, if you're an e-commerce company, your e-commerce data and everything. How many win back, come on, you guys, how many win back campaigns have you seen the decisions to, to do a win back campaign have been based on lack of opens? And then I go and ask them, mm. did you actually go to see, have they been, have they logged in, have they purchased, have mm. they, you know, okay. have they done anything? Oh no, we didn't do that. So they're saying we miss you, and that person could have actually just bought last week, but they no, wouldn't know. Exactly. Yeah, I'm just on your right. site. How could you miss me? Right. So, exactly. Uh, exactly. As a as a as a way to wrap up and a, and a great kind of transition from from the rant, right? <laughs> so Ryan's close bracket. Ryan's rant uh, about uh, subject lines cast uh, equally valid rant about um, the tech not not supporting us as marketers. Uh, Matthew Dunn has asked, um, you know, basically, I think Matthew agrees with Kath. He says, uh, ESP data handling is uh, pretty sucky. His quote, not mine. Uh, and, you know, are we gonna see uh, email marketers move away from their ESP, move their email data out of their ESP into something that they can actually use to segment better? And then I'm going to add on to that. Uh, so we'll love an answer on that. And also, what do you all think? So we know what the last 18 months has been like. What are the next 18 months going to bring? On the first point, I would, I would hope that marketers actually have replicate data of their master database, right? And the ability to, uh, for the marketer to run queries inside of their email, data, email database to try and find insights and try and test new things. And, and that's where you, you mail from is that master database with only the fields that you need. And you've, you've got the ability either to do SQL or some other tactic to create a segment, right? List-based uh, ESP, you know, list-based scenarios with ESPs are, are harmful to long-term uh, uh, data handling in, in terms of response, right? So I, I, 
I, I just think marketers need to rethink their data structures inside of their ESP and in connection with their master database, right? And, and you always have a source of all information and that's where the queries can be done. But you also as a marketer need the ability to run some simple stuff up in the cloud, right? As to the, the uh, and I'll answer, I'll answer the last one later, but that would be my first pass on the ESPs. Mm. Totally, totally agree. Oh, yeah. uh, it's, it's a process. And I think mm -hmm. that in terms of, I mean, this kind of leans into the next 18 months, but data engineering is going to be really important as a marketing function. I literally mm -hmm. just hired a data engineer for my team, not to sit in data engineering, but to sit on my team because company-wide data engineering only cares about collecting the data. They don't care about really using it. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it's about, it's about activating that to your point, Ryan, the correct data for segmentation targeting. There's also the, you know, that, that centralization is important because, you know, ES, a lot of ESPs have pixels on site to track things. Are they c collecting the correct information? So you have to really dive into that and, and compare, let's say you have a web tag manager over here on the e-com team and your, your ESPs pixel tracking, put them together. Are they tracking the same things? So mm -hmm. there are a lot of pieces there. Uh, purchase behavior obviously super important to Kath's point, win backs shouldn't just be about re-engagement because if they haven't, if they're on your list for a year and they haven't bought anything and they're not responding to email, they're probably checked out. But if they're not like we've done direct mail, for example, that kicks mm -hmm. ass sending it to mm -hmm. unsubscribes. They don't want our emails, but they want to buy our products. Right. So you have yeah. to think about it holistically from that perspective. And that information is not going to be sitting in your ESP. Right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it becomes, you have to have a, you have to view data from a channel agnostic point of view, but a marketing point of view mm -hmm. so that, but that is a super big challenge. But I would yeah. say that, that, like I said, for the next 18 months, data engineering is going to become important because you're going to have, mm -hmm. I mean, our, our MarTech stack is stupid. Like it's just big. And I don't know how many of them talk to each other. So my mm -hmm. data engineer, I'm like, by the way, here's the MarTech stack. You have six projects. Let's go. And she hasn't quit yet on day two. So thank God. Um, but that's, that's, the, that's the reality of the situation is you just have to get that smart. Like you need to have that unified view. I hate to say CDPs, but unified view of the customer that really is accurate mm -hmm. and sits sure. not yeah. just on a database, but in a place you can push it everywhere. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really excited about you having a, a, an email data engineer because what I found, you know, I was, when I go work with the client and they go, oh yeah, yeah, we've got the, you know, the data team and, you know, we've got some, you know, great people there and everything. They're so slow. And they're not, and I'm not saying that that's a limitation of them, but they're not set up to deal with the fast pace of email, mm. right? With our constant oh, it's a priority demand. Issue too. It's a priority yes, issue, it yep. is long. To, it's way, way down the bottom. You know, right, everything right, right. like this. And so well, to it, actually it, have yeah. your own, that's great. That is cool. I was going to say it's also uh, an operational issue in the sense that, you know, data engineers sitting at a corporate level, they're worried about you know, a production system For sure. and, that, you know, mm -hmm. anything that might break that production system, yep. you know, that's what keeps, literally keeps them awake at night. Yep. Yep. Um, with an email is if you got your own and especially as long as you, you can overcome the not invented here syndrome, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That would be, yeah. uh, that would be really super powerful. Yeah. Well, hey, viewing, what do you think? viewing the email process as a mini production system, it's one of the reasons I really like email because it, it is very much like a production system. Um, it's a very powerful kind of mindset, at least the mindset I bring to it, which is cool. I feel like this is a huge opportunity. I, I agree with what everyone has said already, and I feel like this is a huge opportunity for ESPs to get into data and present the data in ways to marketers that are really valuable and actionable to them, um, either within their own standard reporting that already exists, but then also to provide really easy ways to get all of the data that's in their databases out and into these master data uh, master databases or um, or wherever wherever marketers want to store it via more comprehensive APIs and you know, more, more detailed CSV exports. I just feel like there's yeah. lots of opportunity 
to connect people with a lot of the data that they're collecting, but they don't have easy ways to pull it out or easy ways to view it. So I think that that's a huge opportunity. Yeah. Ryan, you, 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 you punted your future prediction. I punted the future prediction. I would say the next, uh, so my future prediction is number one, marketers should not forget the agility that they learned in 2020. The ability to pivot, the ability mm -hmm. to make a decision, to uh, release and iterate, right? Agile marketing is not just a, a, a squishy term. It works and it works really well. And I think we've seen a lot of marketers and a lot of companies that turn to that. That's my first thing is, is don't forget that and, and learn it. The second thing is, is to adopt this, this mantra of data sciences is how I wanna do my segmentation. There is, mm -hmm. just like in the title for this webinar, is the fluidity of data is not over yet. You still have parts of the country that are have bad COVID rates. You still have people recovering. You still have people hesitant. You still do not know what's going on as much as you think you do. Mm -hmm. And what you, what you may look in your data and say, oh, we're back to normal, is a mix of people that are hesitant about your brand and about the behavior and a, and a mix of people that are new and exploring it and they're washing out the true insights. And without data sciences, without really looking at a cohort analysis, propensity-driven analysis, those kind of things, you really are confused as to where you're going and that's not where you wanna be. The third thing is, is that it is time to start getting back to a normal kind of mentality where, and I think Skip, you said it earlier, COVID is a, is, is a mention, is an important thing to do, but it's not the context of the entire email. It's not the entirety of it. And we need to remember our humanity. We need to remember our compassion. We need to remember our authenticity, which is the main reason a lot of good companies got through 2020 is that they keyed in on their brand voice and their brand equity and were able to echo that in communications fairly fast and fairly well. That's you know, Ryan, that's, that's a really in interesting, uh, three very interesting points. The thought I had while you were saying all that is um, it's like the person that exercises to get ready for the class reunion or the wedding or the whatever, mm -hmm. and the day after the wedding is like, well, that's over. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be in shape anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to right? McDonald's. You know. The, wedding, the, the wedding's happened, but there will be another wedding. There'll be another wedding. You're going to get divorced and you're going to have another wedding fairly soon. <laughs> wow. Wow. I took, He's not wrong. I took your analogy and went like this. Yeah. You did. Wow. You did. Wow. Uh, wow. Uh, wow. We got to work on that. Kat, uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you wrap us up? What are your predictions for the next 18 months? Uh, seriously, I just agree with absolutely everything that Ryan said. I, can't, I couldn't state it any better. Mm -hmm. um, he and I have talked about this a lot. So, so he, he kind of, you know, um, I yeah, stole it for he all the math. No, you didn't. No, this is this is you, baby. No, he nailed it. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, we've we've run over uh, by quite a bit, actually. That's a shock. Uh, and I apologize. I yeah. Uh, I, I apologize to the folks that were looking forward to the roundtables. We'll, we'll still go there. Uh, we've got some time left uh, to do that. Um, but the conversation was so good that I didn't want to uh, end it any earlier. And in fact, we could probably keep just going and going and going mm. if we, if and we wanted to. Um, but like I said, that's that's what we have time for today. So uh, please let us know what you thought. Adding any any comments into the chat. We've already had one from Tracy. Um, she had to jump off early, but but uh, really enjoyed it. Um, and we just like to see that we, we did well. Um, before, uh, before we move on, please, please, um, uh, uh, wait, sorry. Let's try that again. Here we go. Sponsors first. Always do the sponsors first. Give me, please give a big thanks to our uh, gold sponsors, Iterable and Validity, and our silver sponsors, RPE Origin. Thanks, Ryan, and Email Expert. Uh, and of course, a big thank you to our speakers, uh, Scott, Ada, Ryan, and Kath. Uh, you guys, great insight, great insight. And uh, most of all, thank, thank you all for um, you. spending your time with us today. Now, we're, Kath and I are back uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, please, please join us then. And for those that have joined us live, 
Uh, we'll, we're going to go over to the round tables now. Come on, wake up. There you go. There you go. Uh, we're going to go over to the round tables now. One member or one attendee of the round tables will win uh, the Kindle version of Cass' book. Very exciting. That is holistic email marketing, rooster not included. Oh, I would pull mine out. I would, I would get my copy, but it's in a box <laughs> along with the rest of my office. I was going to say, I, I, I was going to comment on the token plant, but I decided <laughs> not to. Token, that's, that's all I got left. It's a very it's empty office. Um, so anyway, please join us at the round tables. Go find a table, sit down, turn on your mic, turn on your camera. Don't worry if you're wearing some sort of uh, uh, dodgy outfit. We won't judge. We don't care. It's not going to be recorded. Um, and uh, yeah. If you Thanks, guys. This was fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you all. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. And if, if for those of you who can't join us at the roundtables, again, thank you for spending some time with us today. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, stay safe and make good choices. Yeah. Good choices. <laughs>